look rich. Margie Adams, it's been years and years, though I knew you at once by your sticking out ears. <laughs> and you married, what's it? The one with red hair. My husband's a judge now. I knew we'd get there. Own two children? Silly me, I had four. And they're all excelling at uni, what's more. Why are you here? Where did you leave your car? You're traveling by bus. Poor you, is it far? I've not once caught a bus, not since we left school. Travel always in comfort is my golden rule. Well, enough about me. Let's talk about you. You've been to the Seychelles. Oh, well, I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to post but I've traveled most parts. I'm a friend of the zoo and a patron of arts. As a leader of fashion, I've gained modest fame. But don't worry about you, we can't all look the same. <laughs> so where do you live? No, I've not heard of that. But never mind, dear. I'm enjoying our chat. I'm such a good mixer. So all my friends say, put folk right at their ease and brighten their day. You're very quiet, Margie. Tap what your tongue. You were just the same way when we were both young. There's classes, you know, where you learn to speak out. Self-improvement's my motto. It's what I'm about. <clears throat> Do you see many school friends? I'm afraid I've lost track. I called several people, but they've never called back. <laughs> oh dear, I'm a stash. My poor nails were fright. You seem rather thin. Um, oh, sorry, my poor nails are flat. Then I'm eating lunch, though I won't eat a bite. You seem rather thin, and though that's no disgrace, at our age, Marge, it shows. <laughs> Don't look so worried. You can catch the next bus. Wasn't this fun? This little chat about us. <laughs> Thanks, Beverly. So I'm just going to read uh, two poems because um, oh, that was in there because I wasn't. Oh, sure. Because I did promise I'd read one from Hildegard, so uh, I've got that one there. The first one. This is my daughter up here, and she sent me this photo, and I thought, oh, this fits in so beautifully with this little poem, "Taking Wings." If ever there were a summer day so perfect, so romantic under the mild autumn sun, constantly making love to the trees and flowers, that it made you wish to tear at your shackles, rip off your yoke, feel exposed to its sharp pinion, and to give yourself over to brash colour, without an iota of worry, a day that made you pack a sandwich and a bottle of water to set out, to walk quite ways, catching the song of tiny birds brimming in wild blackberry brumbles. And for a moment, feel your heart sing with even a quaver of gratitude. Well, today is just that kind of day. And this is from Hildegard. It's, um, it's a story of um, the first time as a young girl, uh, Hildegard was sort of, as you know, she was in the convent and very strictly in the convent. And then she gets a chance to go and to see a scriptorium we're speaking about 12th century. So the scriptorium is where 
the books are, are made. Maybe it is the light that illuminates jars of coloured minerals, powders. Maybe the smell of curing skin or sharp tang of vinegar. It could be the plated basket of moss and flour, blue woad dye, or the sharp smell of ink pestled down from bald oak. Maybe the sight of scrolls rolled into alcoves or shelved parchments or the elaborate books of saints behind the monk Bolma enshrined on the cum deck. Perhaps it is the copy of Ptolemy's astronomy or the manuscripts Bolma points out from all over the Christian and the Arab world. Maybe just crossing the threshold when Hildegard steps through the door, inhales the air and feels immediately at home in a world that sharpens curiosity. Hildegard knows she has found her calling. She wants to be a maker of books. And Hildegard went on to write seven large manuscript books about divine works, about um, medical and scientific uh, works, a morality play, a lot of poetry, 77 um, beautiful musical chants. So that was the beginning of when she discovered um, the smell in the cover of books. I thought as writers, we would all appreciate that one. When a young girl in the 12th century, one of the first, first women ever to write books and had to stand up to the monks and the bishop and the popes and everybody who tried to keep her silent, as a woman was supposed to be. And the last one, that I've tried to write it. This is, oh no, I won't say that. This is a, my funny one. In the clouds. This is when I got my first, um, this is about five years old, when I got a new um, Apple Mac, and, uh, Mac. In the clouds. As a child, I loved to lie on grass, see shapes in clouds, I see feathers and angels. As a poet, I have dreamt of clouds, marshmallow at sunset, cauliflower by day, ruffled at dusk. On my new Mac Air, I composed the first draft of a poem, push save, and it goes to iCloud. <laughs> Then the panic sets in. I rush outside, except for a tiny airbrush, cloudless. Should I have done this yesterday when there was a swarm of clouds? If there was fog then, surely that's not ideal. This would only be reliable if we lived under a cloud. Far too gloomy for me. Some say I have my head in the clouds. Maybe I would like to live on cloud nine, but that's not good for a writer. Sometimes on the horizon, I see a cloud bank, but no one trusts banks today. I know we have cloud bursts, especially in summer. What will happen to my poem then? Maybe this iCloud concept, the clouds, the issue. Colmimus, although poetic, are unstable. Glinting cirrus are too high and made of crystal. Nimbus would serve the purpose, thick and grey, but stratus are soft and luxurious. My poem would swoon, curled up there. <laughs> Some of you, some of you might have been on the Zoom in September, I think it was, when I gave the talk um, on, on my new um, verse novel, Olive Pink, Olive New York Pink, and um, that was on Swoon, Swoon um, Zoom. I mean, Swoon, Swoon still swimming in the That was on Zoom, and um, Elizabeth got three copies of um, Olive Pink down there. You can buy them um, on card or um, cash. Okay, there's three down there. Thank you. <laughs> 